Welcome everyone to our event on, on nourishing gender equality. Here at the Action Against Stunting Hub, we are absolutely delighted to be hosting this event with A Thousand Days organization. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with A Thousand Days, they're a leading nonprofit in the US and they've managed to create a wide scale global partnership spanning 90 institutions across all areas of child development. And I'm sure Emma from A Thousand Days will, will tell us a bit more. Um, but just leading into this topic, I think across the decades, there's been a, a, a really a large body of work to demonstrate that food security and, and related malnutrition are, are generally gendered issues. But it's, it's really only been in recent years that there's been this real move across the nutrition community to unpack what this means. So we've seen a, a much wider shift to more integrated approaches from the life course event to the whole child approach, which is something that the hub is, is, is uh, applying and hopefully our speakers will talk, touch on this a bit more. But we also know, and this is work done by Emma's organization, Thousand Days, that, that programs that invest in women and children tend to yield benefits up to, so for every $1 invested, there's $35 increase of benefit. And I mean, that's unbelievable. So, you know, to meet SDG2, the estimate's about $7 billion a year for the next decade. So if you put it in the context of the kind of benefits that we could create from essentially nourishing gender equality, it's really unbelievable what we could achieve. So I think one of the questions afterwards will be, why aren't we? What are the blockages to this kind of investment and to this kind of support? So I'd very much like to welcome our, our panel of speakers. We're delighted to, to have people today from uh, across uh, across the globe as it is. Um, so welcome to Emma Feutel Kent. She's our first speaker. She is the manager of global policy and, and advocacy at A Thousand Days. She's responsible for the policy advocacy and leadership agenda. Uh, previously, she was the operations lead for the Eleanor Crick Foundation. She holds a master's in global policy uh, with a concentration in international development from the school of LBJ School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas in Austin. She's the author of the Thousand Days Report, Nourish, Nourishing Gender Equality, How Nutrition Interventions Are an Underleveraged Tools to Fight for Women's Rights. And today she's going to take us through key elements of the report. So a very, very warm welcome to you, Emma. Thank you so much, Claire. I'm just going to get this set up. And there we go. All right. Well, um, hello, good evening, good morning to those of you for whom this is morning. My name is Emma Feudel Kent, and I'm calling in from 1000 Days, which is headquartered in Washington, DC. I'm thrilled to be here today to talk about how women's empowerment and nutrition sectors can be working together to advance both of our goals more effectively. So I wanted to start by talking a little bit about the resource itself. Um, we're really excited about this new resource. Um, and we just released this report uh, about a month ago. And um, I really was inspired to write this report because I've seen a lot of this really great work coming out about um, how investing in women's empowerment and including women's empowerment interventions in our nutrition interventions is a key part of empowering women, uh, of reaching our, sorry, how including um, women's empowerment investments is a key part of reaching our nutrition goals. But from an advocacy standpoint, I've seen a little bit less about how investing in nutrition can actually also empower women. And so I wanted to pull together a framing document is what we're calling it, of key examples of how um, women's empowerment actors and nutrition um, actors can work together better to leverage these investments. All right, I'm just going to... Great, okay. So as many of you know, malnutrition continues to be an, uh, a blight really on our societies today. Um, it leads to lower lifetime earnings, less formal education, long-term health consequences and immediate health consequences, stunted cognitive development, and ultimately to premature death. Um, the threats from NCDs, from severe pneumonia and diarrhea, which is 
really uh, especially relevant today are extreme. And this is a problem, especially for women, because they are 50% more likely to be undernourished than men and boys are, which is huge. More than a billion women today are undernourished and are malnourished. And this number is rising, unfortunately, across all categories of malnutrition. And there's a lot of reasons why women and girls are more likely to be malnourished. They are what we might say doubly vulnerable from both a biological perspective, they have unique nutritional needs, but also from an economic perspective, women are much more likely to be poor, to face poverty. And they're also more likely to eat last and least in their household, especially during times of food insecurity, which I think we're gonna to start to see a lot more of in the coming months as the secondary effects of COVID-19 take over. Fortunately, uh, women's empowerment and nutrition are mutually reinforcing. Uh, as I mentioned before, we're starting to see more and more evidence, uh, great evidence of the ways that um, including women's empowerment components into our nutrition programming can help us reach our goals. We know that educated mothers, for example, are much more likely to um, have well-nourished children than poorly educated mothers, um, but there's also a virtuous cycle. And so it behooves us all to act together on this. So I would be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about the thousand day window of opportunity. Many of you may be familiar with this, but this is a critical window in any child and mother's life. It's the window between a mother's pregnancy and a two year old when a child reaches two years old. So this is a key time for development, both of the body and the brain. And it's this brief and powerful window when a nutrition investment can really have an outsized impact on that mother and that child for the rest of their lives. So if you can see this, um, this diagram here shows the uh, development of a brain in a stunted child and in a healthy and well-nourished child. And you can really see that it's much less developed in a stunted child. And these have lifelong implications. So our report focuses on three key outcomes of interest um, based on the World Economic Forum's uh, outcomes of interest for um, gender. And the report focuses on health and survival, on women's economic empowerment, and on women's education. But today I'm gonna to be focusing mainly on women's economic participation and opportunity. And I believe the other panelists will be focusing a little bit more on the other two issues. So, Economic empowerment for women is, is not only an important, um, important in and of itself, but it's also important for helping women to achieve their rights in other areas. Um, while the benefits of investing in the thousand day window uh, economically for the rest of, of people's lives accrue to both men and women, they arguably have an outsized impact on women who are much more likely to face poverty. And this is, key because children who are stunted are 33% less likely to escape poverty as adults. So this malnutrition is really contributing to this cycle of poverty, especially because it becomes intergenerational. So we have some really great evidence of this over the long term. These studies are hard to set up, but um, we are so lucky that in the 1960s, um, some researchers began a study in Guatemala looking at uh, the difference between supplementing with a protein energy supplement and supplementing with a placebo. Uh, and they did this between, I think, four villages, and then they followed these children. And so they've been following up with these children regularly for, uh, I think, almost 40 years now, or 50 years probably. And they've seen some really interesting long-term patterns. Uh, for example, uh, women complete, in the same years of schooling, complete 1.2 grades more women there's higher reading comprehension and intelligence scores, which is a huge part of that cognitive development. And importantly to this subject, uh, average wages for men increased by 46% for those who were well-nourished in that first thousand day window. And a, a lot of the reason that we're not seeing those same drastic increases for women is due to the fact that uh, just labor divisions are different in Guatemalan society. And so a lot of women aren't doing um, formal paid labor and uh, researchers speculate that in other settings we might see different outcomes. And we also have a study from Barbados that follows over the long term 
children at, who are malnourished and children who are well nourished and, and all other factors are comparable. And in the long term, uh, not only did the well nourished children go on to earn significantly more, but these differences in socioeconomic outcomes actually widened as their lives went on. So this becomes increasingly important throughout their lives. But nutrition and uh, economic empowerment don't just stem from investments in that thousand day window as powerful as, as it is. Malnutrition continues to affect women's earning potentials throughout the rest of their lives. And a really good example of this is iron deficiency anemia which uh, I think 67% of adults with iron deficiency anemia of non-elderly uh, adults are women, which is pretty stunning because iron deficiency anemia impacts your ability to work in many ways. Um, physically, it is, leads to lethargy and um, illness, and that often results in absenteeism. And they found that for women engaging in heavy manual labor or for people engaging in heavy manual labor like smallholder farming, many of whom are women, uh, that giving iron supplements actually resulted in a 17% increase in productivity. And also mental impairment, a lot of these cognitive delays lead to long-term um, earning reductions. And these cognitive delays happen even if someone becomes anemic in their adult life as well. Ultimately, this all results in lower earnings and women who don't have the economic power to uh, pursue other things in their lives. So nutrition today is an under leveraged investment in the fight for women's empowerment. These two graphs are important because the one on the left shows how much of women's empowerment, uh, how much of, of nutrition is uh, devoted to women's empowerment targets. So that's the percentage of basic nutrition interventions with women's empowerment as a principal or significant target. So we see 83% of women's empowerment or of nutrition interventions have women's empowerment as a target. And yet, despite this ability to not only uh, empower women, but also have just a monumental effect on children for their entire lives, nutrition spending makes up only nine only 0.5, less than 1% of all official development assistance. And so we really see that, that despite this huge uh, impact and potential, I'm so glad Claire mentioned the, um, the result of investing $1 in nutrition and, and how that has such an outsized economic impact. Um, but we see such a small investment in nutrition itself. And now more than ever, nutrition is going to be important. I think women's empowerment and nutrition are both at risk during this next phase of responding to COVID, to getting lost in other vitally important um, interventions that immediately are dealing with the immediate effects of the virus. But in the long term, um, if we don't start planning now for how the secondary effects are going to impact women's empowerment and nutrition, we are going to be too late eventually. And so I think this is such a critical opportunity for us to begin working together more um, deliberately by, for nutrition actors, that 83% number of interventions that have women's empowerment as a key outcome, that should be 100%. And so nutrition advocates can uh, advocate for gender mainstreaming in all nutrition programs. Um, there really is no downside. And women's empowerment actors can advocate for gender focused programming to feature nutrition interventions more prominently. So it's, it's always good. Um, nutrition can be a key part of existing interventions um, and it's, it can be added in on top of what's already going on. So um, that is the message I would like to leave you with that women's empowerment and nutrition need to work together in this challenging time and that Together, we will be stronger. Thank you so much. Wow, oh, Emma, thank you very much for that. There are some really powerful statistics in there that I yeah, hope we have time yeah. to unpack in our discussion. Thank you for that. All right, our next speaker is uh, Professor Lynn Ang, and she is Professor of Early Childhood Development and Head of the Department of Learning and Leadership at U UCL IOE. Uh, she's a co-I and a theme lead on the Action Against Stunting Hub. She has a wide range of research interests, including the social, cultural, and policy influences on children's development and early learning across a range of formal and informal contexts. Um, 
her research centers on the early year curriculum, international early years policy, issues with diversity and inequality, particularly in conflict affected fragile states. And Lynn is talking to us today about the role of early childhood education in nourishing gender equality. Thank you very much for this and a very, very big welcome to you, Lynn. Hi, can everyone hear me? Here. <laughs> yes, okay, great. Great, and can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Yeah, okay, fantastic. Well, first of all, just to say thank you very much, and I'm really pleased to be joining all of you um, today. Um, and I should start by saying that I am an educationalist, so what I'll be sharing with you um, in the next few minutes is from an education perspective um, about the role of early childhood education in nourishing gender equality, and I hope my reflections will bring a different and distinct perspective to the discussions. Um, so I thought I would start by setting out um, the education position and it was you know really insightful for me to also to um, as I was preparing for this talk to think about how far we've come as a field right so I thought I created this I created this timeline to show how um, far we've come as, as a field because I thought this was important to kind of take stock and, and look back and I think the pivotal for, for a moment for all of us in education was the convention of the rights of the child in the 1990s that formed a broad vision if you like of education as a human right and a force for you know social change um, and, and the, the convention was seminal in many ways and I'm sure all of you are familiar with this but I think importantly what it did was it recognized that even though children's access to education is unequal and we know we live in an unequal world um, all children do have a right to education um, and as can, you can see from the timeline of events you know the field has been propelled by significant advances um, in, in research you know from a series of Lancet papers for instance um, about early childhood development through the life course and this is taken from the Lancet papers they have significantly significantly informed our understanding of early development and learning um, and we, you know, um, as our earlier speakers mentioned, you know, we know the evidence well. The first thousand days of a child's life con from conception to the second birth, they are critical for the future well-being. Um, and we know that children who experience good quality care and education during their formative years have, a, you know, have shown positive short and long-term gains um, in later educational outcomes. So what has also been interesting um, from, uh, the, from the field of education, um, Sorry, I'm just trying to moon over my slides. Um, is uh, you know the, how how it, things have shifted in, in the last past in the past twenty years is the shift of, in thinking from a mainly education perspective to a much stronger fo focus on early childhood development and the wider recognition of that important intersections between education, um, health, nutrition, uh, human development, and of course the broader issues of social and gender equality um, and we know that you know education is no longer perceived as, as a kind of marginal but critical to the development discourse um, and knowing that you know education systems and programs should continue to acknowledge the importance of attending to early nutrition consistent with the messages for many advocates um, in the field and across disciplines on the importance of building integrated childhood systems um, so while the concept of education and international development in a way is not new, I think how we as a field in education engage with you know, development studies and build those bridges with other disciplines such as health and nutrition and also the social sciences more broadly is still rather novel. Um, and, and early childhood development had also has important interse intersections with gender equality. Um, so the, the drive towards achieving women's empowerment, as we know, and the well-being of children um, was articulated, I thought, very clearly, exactly in, in the Leave No Girl campaign, Leave No Girl Behind campaign, sorry, that was launched at the United, um, United Nations Assembly two years ago, where I attended in 2018. Um, but we also know, you know, that the journey has, in, in a way, has only very much begun, you know, despite the progress, um, some of the education indicators that um, was published, for instance, last year in 2019 on equitable access, um, school completion and learning outcomes show how gender disparities um, across the regions um, continues to be a challenge. And of course, girls in poor household, we know, face some of the worst disadvantages. Um, you know, th what it tells us is that the impact of gender is evident in every facet of education, um, and particularly during the formative years in childhood where 
we know from research that discrimination between boys and girls and the way they are socialized into di different gender roles during these formative years can also have an impact on education. So it got me thinking, you know, what does this mean for us as academics, um, as researchers and practitioners? And from an education perspective, I think it's about recognizing the layers of influence on your young child's development. Um, and this diagram here shows the ecological approach um, and it depicts the kind of multiple ecologies that shape development and learning. Um, and I think the ecological approach is a very powerful paradigm as it places the child, the whole child at the center stage and accounts for all these multiple complex layers of influence um, on a young child's development, as you can see from the concentric circles. Um, and of course, it is this whole child approach that underpins the work that we are currently working on um, in the Action Against Stunting Research Hub. Um, and essentially, it's premise on the principles that you know, early learning and development cannot be understood outside of a you know, wider historical, social, cultural context. Um, uh, this seems simplistic, but of course, we know different kinds of upbringing shape human development. Um, and they, I think the idea of the whole child approach is extremely um, it's also transformative because it shows that the broader global challenges, you know, of inequality, of poverty, um, of vulnerability are multi-causal. So although education, including early childhood education, may make an important contribution, um, but we cannot on its own, or, and, or the field can on its own, redress some of these wider inequalities. So our aim as education is, is essentially, you know, to support early learning and development. Um, and, and our lifelong work, you know, as educationists is to answer that critical question, how best do children learn? Um, and we know that preschool education is, you know, a perfect protective factor that underpins later educational attainment. We know that children can learn when given the right conditions um, with positive family and home environment, um, enabling school and preschool environments, um, of course, positive parental support, involvement, and nurturing teacher-child interactions. Um, and we also know that learning can take place even in some of the most low resource environments. And I have seen, you know, really good learning taking place in environments where it's absolutely, um, you know, of very low resources, very little in terms of infrastructure, but you know, learning still takes place. And I think schools and educational settings, preschools in disadvantaged communities you know, they can beat the odds and enable children to achieve and thrive despite their um, adverse learning experiences. So an important concept in supporting learning um, is that concept of school readiness um, and that transition from home to preschool and then from preschool to primary school is often that is the first and major transitional um, process that children encounter in the educational life. Um, we know a study in Tanzania, for instance, you know, examining school readiness showed that family home environments and teacher-child relationships in supporting children's school adjustment have a profound influence on children's learning. Um, and school readiness is often conceptualized in three dimensions. Um, you know, ready children, meaning nurturing and positive learning dispositions, that's important um, to support learning and development ready preschools or schools. So schools must be ready to adapt to the diverse and changing needs of children to provide that en enabling environment to foster their educational achievement. And of course, ready families, you know, um, that refers to the kind of parental and caregiver attitudes and involvement in their support for early learning. Um, that is so important in supporting children's transition, transition and readiness for school. But importantly, as um, in the field, we also, I think, need to recognize that getting children ready for school or school readiness um, is also about looking beyond a narrow inter interpretation of preparing children just for compulsory schooling um, that stresses, you know, the, the usual literacy and numeracy sk skills. It is also about supporting the emotional, psychosocial, social skills that will support children's transition, not just to schooling, but to a broader preparation for lifelong learning, you know, be beyond just a school-based curriculum. And then finally, um, I wanted to, sh to say a bit about um, the role of preschool teachers, um, a, a critical issue, you know, that's close to my own heart, um, because I started my career as a preschool teacher myself, um, is the role of preschool teachers, practitioners, uh, all those who are directly um, involved with young children's learning in the classrooms, in the schools um, or even the, you know, the community centers. Um, preschool teachers 
do matter. You know, we know from the strength of research that if there is a single most important contributor to the quality of education um, and indeed the driving force towards social improvement and mobility and equality, it is the quality of the teaching workforce. Um, you know, the, the quality of education system is only as good as the quality of its teachers. Um, so, for example, we know from some of the research that cognitively stimulating and emotionally supportive teacher-child interactions um, are positively associated with, you know, later gains in school readiness. And we, there are two international surveys of preschool teachers which indicate how teacher training and, and, you know, providing good teacher training and professional development are key to affecting learning outcomes. Um, and I think, you know, even more so now in, in a pandemic like this, you know, preschool teachers and teachers in general are really, at, you know, the frontline workers who are at the frontline of educating, caring for young children, and they must be adequately trained, qualified, um, but also properly remunerated in, 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 in status and pay to provide the best they can for young children. So just to conclude, um, I thought I'll share, you know, uh, some concluding re reflections. Um, I think as, you know, across uh, um, the world as early childhood development services continue to expand, um, and we know there has been a prolific increase in expansion in provision um, in many countries and governments try to scale up interventions at cost. Um, I think it's important to remember that expanding ac access to services alone without attention to quality will not deliver the outcomes that we want for children or the longer term productivity benefits for, si to so for society. Um, what we know is that you know, if quality is low, then it, it can have long lasting de detrimental effects on child development. So you know, prioritization of quality over access is just as important. So thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Lynn, for that really comprehensive overview. Thank you for that. Um, our next speaker is Prof. Mari Harder, and Mari is a professor at both Fudan University in China and the University of Brighton in the UK, and where she is the founder and lead of the Values and Sustainability Research Group. And Mari's work uh, is absolutely fascinating. She uses transdisciplinary approaches to identify what, what she terms as intersubjective values. And she works across households and communities to institutions. She is the co-I on the Action Against Stunting Hub where she's the theme lead for social values. And her work focuses on identifying some of the kind of core values around child nutrition and health across the communities that we're working in. Um, a very big uh, welcome to you, Mari. Thank you for joining thank us. Very much. Thank you. Okay, let's get this screen. Okay, well, thank you very much for the uh, introduction. Yes, my name is Mari Harder, and um, it's, it's really quite hard to shift around <clears throat> what we're doing. Oh, is it actually playing? Oh, sorry. Okay, I have a feeling this has a timer on it, which I didn't intend, so I might have to keep moving it back. Um, right, so I, it was quite interesting to shift around uh, what I'm doing to fit the particular uh, frame of gender and nutrition, but I've done my best. Let's see where we go with that. Um, I'm also going to be very, very naughty and um, mention that there is a funded PhD opportunity with this project. If there's anybody out there interested in it, the deadline is early July. This includes a, uh, a stipend. And there are also postdoctorate positions based in Shanghai. Um, and there's, there are other PhD opportunities for any country. Uh, and also the postdoc position can be from people from any country. Now let's move on to the question. Can we increase, how can we increase a shared value like new, good nutrition or equality without knowing more about the envelopes of other shared values of the people involved? So right from the beginning, I'm going to say, you know what, I don't think we can do any one without at least a basic knowledge of the others. Not well, anyway. And this is in the context uh, we are part of the UKRI Action Against Stunting Hub, which Claire Hefferman is the, is the PI for. And it involves um, amazing participants and co-researchers from Senegal, India and Indonesia. It's such a privilege to work with them. As you know, it's about child stunting as a wicked problem. In, in case I'm going too quickly, this whole project that the speakers today are, are, uh, are from this project, which is about child stunting, but we come from really different backgrounds and that's the beauty of it. So the, the, the project takes a whole child approach and it's gonna have strands 
with specialists in each of these areas that you see on the screen. Um, but absolutely from the, from the set off, we are all working together to try to understand uh, the overlaps and how to treat it as a whole child approach in a kind of ecological um, manner. And the shared values that I'm doing runs through all of these because um, all of these touch in one way or another on the shared values of the participants and the target beneficiaries. So how can shared values approaches be useful in this case? Well, the way is by articulating the in situ, so the existing in position, in situ shared values of the local people that, are, that we're trying to reach. So if you see on the top, this is kind of undefined shared values that any people who do things together have, kind of values in action. And we have a very special process, which it's taken us years and years to develop, uh, which we're, we're just beginning to use in a generalizable form now. And through it, we can untangle and make much better defined the shared values of a group so that they actually come up with their own statements. We, we provide a, a scaffolding for them to develop their own statements and frameworks of what their shared values are. Now in this diagram, I've put them on the right and I've called them things like children's education, moral conduct, but it's whatever the local group decides. And they don't actually look like a straight line. That was for simplicity. They look more like this. This is an example from a Nigerian village. On the top right, you can see we value the protection of God. In the middle, towards the bottom, we value eating together. And these are a, a variety, a range, but a kind of an envelope of shared values of that particular group of the most important things to them as a group at that time. This is another example. You can, I'm just trying to show you how the structure can change and the way that they are arranged in the end changes. This is an example from Botswana. They have a, a, um, a framework uh, foundations at the bottom, how we work in the middle, and they decided to put uh, their vision at the top. And this is the one I want to show you a bit today. It's uh, from the stunting project. And this is the shared values of one group of young mothers, this is the younger mothers in East Lombok in Indonesia. And the structure is not so uh, pronounced, but they have incorporated their photographs. So how did we get these? This, this is how it works, is that that on the left is, is what it looks like at the end of the workshop. Uh, and they produce their own narrative to go with these uh, statements that they have um, produced. And I'd like to read you through this because it, it really doesn't work unless you take the time to, um, to read. Mm. Sorry, something's covering my screen. The so what these women are saying is, we have got together, we've talked about it. I'm gonna show you the process in a minute. And this is what we've decided are our shared values, right? Here we go. The foundation is that a mother should be able to sacrifice her life for her kids. And the mother would like to have a kid who is useful for her society. Also, happiness is the most important to kids and the ability to survive is the heart of everything because we need to, we will in life, struggle. So the mothers need to support. A mother makes sacrifices for her child. We, have our, we value our children and do not neglect them. Those are two of their value statements. The kids' happiness come from good living conditions, the education in the home, and therefore we have these statements. We respect elderly people, and the children know the Arabic letters in order to be able to read the Quran. From the family side, whatever happens, we need to be able to be united as a whole family. We need to have a sense of forgiveness for the comparison, for compassion showing by the parents. They need to get close emotionally, especially between mother and kids. And the statements are that we protect ourselves in difficult or disastrous circumstances for the family. We need to interact respectfully with each other, older and younger, and be mindful of tone of speech. So just to pause for a second, these are the things that this group of mothers have said is their kind of um, equally important envelope of shared values that belong together if you ask them what's important to them about their life as mothers in Lombok. So just to continue, we have a responsibility to keep the children healthy and proper study and play so that in the end, they will give some benefit to others. Therefore, we have the statements, school is regarded as a foundation for the future development of religion, homeland and nation. Mothers maintain children's health by cooking vegetables that they can afford. 
So for the first time, we have a mention of nutrition or food, okay? But it's in this matrix of other shared values. We need to be able to introduce the collaborative work to the kids so that they later can have a good wider social environment when we may not be able to fight for them on our own. Then the society will help the kids. So we have these statements that family is highly valued because it is the source of encouragement and motivation in life. We go on holiday so our children are refreshed. By this they mean a day trip. The mutual cooperation is considered a foundation for neighbors and society and mothers provide the best life experience that we can for the children. At the very end, we can give very good care to our kids by doing all of these. So in the, this slide, slightly different, I, I've said note the range, note the range of the interrelated topics which are, in, which are in this envelope. We've got a mother makes sacrifices, we've got respect elderly, we've got disastrous circumstances, read the Quran, interact respectfully and so on. It's a range and, and as far as they're concerned, these fit together, even though they've articulated them separately. Well, how did we get this? I just need to show you a little bit about this. The process basically involves a contextualization and then we have photographs to get the, the, the top level shared values. And then we dig a bit deeper with some trigger, trigger statements. Then there is some collective exploration through discussion and then they construct the framework. Don't try this at home, as they say in famous uh, television programs. This is very complicated. It is not as simple as it looks. It can go really wrong, so be careful. Here's an example of this from this actual example. Participant number one, photograph number 25 they chose. So from a big selection of photos they chose it. This is their words. This photograph is important to me because it represents something about, right? So I would like to tighten up the bond between parents and kids because this is really important for the baby, for the kids to have a good family bond. It's really important to show our love and passion as a complete vision as mother and father because I see that some families who is unfortunate because the parents are separated, so lacking in giving compassion to the kids. This is really important for the future because parents' guidance is really, really important for the kids. They need to be close to each other, to the kids. These are the words of these parents, and yet they're specific. First, it's the near, it's the kind of near the surface shared value from the photo, then, they look through a list of trigger statements. So for example, we have trigger statement number 76, which to, um, I could tell you about how those trigger statements are derived. They are locally derived. They are just a scaffolding. There's a big range of them so that there's not as little bias as we can get away with. Um, and they just kind of look at them and when they find one that resonates, they grab it. So somebody grabbed this one and they said, it made them think of something else. It made them think that no matter what happens, we are going to perform as a family. It's important that whatever happens in the family, family, whenever we make mistakes, probably we need to forgive and then we're going to stay as a family and talk. Then there were discussions amongst the different people about what does forgiveness mean? What do we mean by compassion in this case? They're, they are making explicit the values that were tacit and much deeper. Now you can say to me, oh, I'm sorry, I thought this was about nutrition and, and equality. But by sharing this with you, what I'm trying to help uh, convey is that these shared values occur in a matrix. And if you want to talk about equality and gender and empowerment, you need to, in this case, for example, understand how strongly these mothers feel about the strength of a united family. And be very careful that your idea of empowerment with them because you may be actually completely on the, on, on, on the wrong foot. So they talk then about, we are going to keep the family as one, united. There are some discussions about what words they actually want, how to make meaning from negotiate the final statement. And it comes out that family is highly valued because it is the source of encouragement and motivation in life. So then we end up, as I showed you, with this framework. And Marie, with all one, the different- One minute. Mari, we're, yep. we're kind of running over time. Can you run one I'm minute? I'm sorry. Yep. Yeah. So, okay. yeah. So you can't, you, everything um, occurs in clouds, in overlapping clouds and in matrices. Um, and you can see that the mother makes sacrifices in red is about perhaps her role as a woman. 
and then there might be something further down about food and nutrition. And I'm saying if you want to um, if you want to increase a shared value like nutrition or equality, how can you do that without knowing more about the envelopes? And that's really the work I do, understanding the envelopes of shared values before you design an intervention. And that's all. Thank you very much. Oh, Mari, thank you for that. That was really fascinating. Um, okay, our last speaker, uh, last but very much not least, is Professor Paul Haggerty. He is Deputy Director of the Rowett Institute of Nutrition and Health up in Aberdeen. His research explores dietary and social determinants of healthy aging and the importance of early life events. He works on epigenetics and the effects of parental and early life factors uh, in cognition and health. He's a member of the UK Scientific Advisory Committee on Nutrition. He is Deputy Director of the Action Against Stunting Hub, and he is the theme lead on the biology. Um, thank you so much, Paul, for joining us. Okay, th thanks, Claire. Um, <clears throat> let's see what kind of uh, technological mess I can make here. Uh, right, so how nutrition improves physical and cognitive health. Um, so this is about um, uh, the how, and it goes back to uh, uh, Emma's original um, presentation. Um, and uh, thinking here about the value, so um, we heard about this very interesting and useful report um, about um, the effects of early nutrition and how it uh, encourages the uh, productivity, uh, economic independence, healthy babies, etc. So um, there's plenty of evidence now coming out in relation to that. Um, that, um, uh, that this is uh, this is very beneficial, and um, uh, the report also, as Emma showed, goes down deeper into that and um, tries to um, present some of the evidence in terms of uh, how that comes about. Um, what we're interested in is uh, is even deeper than that. We we want to go further down and look at uh, how this actually comes about and um, uh, hopefully it'll become obvious what the, uh, what the reasons for that are. So um, uh, you'll, you'll all know the definition of stunting. Um, stunting is basically, it, it's a continuum, um, but the definition is a, it's a binary category. Uh, you're either stunted or not. Um, so it's defined in terms of stature, but it's clearly deeper than that um, as evidenced by those brain studies. And at the deepest level, um, it's about the, the biology of the genome um, and the choices it makes in terms of the, um, uh, the nutrients and energy that's available to it. And um, this allows us to begin to think about something that we like to call functional stunting, um, which is a change in the biology in response to an early insult. Um, that has long-term consequences, is associated with, but not limited to uh, reduced stature. So it, uh, it actually goes beyond that. Um, and we think it's just one manifestation of a fundamentally altered biology that has important implications for um, physical and mental development and also life chances. Um, so such that you get these fundamental changes because of these early insults, which then um, program the, uh, the response to the environment, including food um, uh, uh, in later life. So the, the mechanism that we are particularly interested in is something called um, uh, epigenetics. We think that this is um, a place where this signal might actually be. And um, I, I can't explain the, um, uh, the concept, the, all of the concepts in epigenetics in a, in a short talk like this, but just to um, uh, briefly give you an overview, it's uh, genetic information is about the sequence of uh, um, letters in the genome. And epigenetics is the information that's superimposed on that, um, that gives those letters meaning. Um, it makes them into sentences, syntax, uh, words uh, with emphasis. So epigenetics is, is a way of changing the genome. Um, uh, and we're particularly interested in the long-term consequences of that. Now there's a great deal of evidence has emerged now to uh, suggest that this mechanism is 
very likely to be important in these things that we're interested in in terms of the uh, the first thousand days and how they can have long term effects. Um, and uh, I've given you just one example here from from our work, um, but there are many, many more studies from many groups across the world looking at this. Um, this is a, a series of studies looking at early life and social status, nutrition, and the effect that that has on the uh, the genomes of children uh, that then persist throughout life. Um, and these changes are also associated with changes in birth outcome, uh, stature, um, and also particularly cognition uh, and brain structure. Um, so, so we think this this is a um, a good place to be um, to be looking for these effects. And um, in terms of um, applying that, um, uh, what we're doing within the uh, the hub that uh, that Claire is leading, and you've heard something about from uh, Marie and others. Um, we're interested in what happens in these first thousand days, how that changes these epigenetic states and the, the longer term effects. But this paradigm is also very interesting and in that opens up new possibilities, new opportunities for thinking about this. For example, um, because there is transgenerational inheritance of some of these uh, states, um, there's the potential that the parental life history may impact on the, uh, the severity of stunting type in the, uh, in, in the offspring. So there are all of these uh, new concepts that um, uh, come out of this, um, this new way of thinking in terms of, uh, of what can happen. And also there are <clears throat> there are long-term consequences. So um, uh, when this baby on the right-hand side is born, um, uh, its stature is telling you something about the underlying biology. But when you look deep into that, if you look into um, uh, epigenetics, there is um, an area of research in this, uh, in this field which is, called, uh, which is related to something called the epigenetic clock which tells you about biological age rather than chronological age. And the thinking is that um, these changes set up a trajectory for, um, for development in later life, which um, actually predict longevity. So um, to what extent, we're, we're asking the question, to what extent is, um, uh, has, has epigenetic change in this baby influenced the life chances of this young woman and, uh, and what can we do to change that? So we've heard about nutrition uh, and the critical importance of nutrition um, in those first thousand days. But one of the things that the, the hub is interested in is that the solution also lies in the complexity of, uh, of what happens in, in stunting. Uh, so nutrition is really important, but there are, it interacts with all these other effects. And one of the values of epigenetics is it integrates all of these influences together. And um, uh, that is uh, particularly uh, valuable um, in terms of what we want to do. So um, the reason why we want to go deeper into this, and we want to look at the underlying biology, um, uh, go beyond the effects of um, nutritional interventions, is that we can start to do these things. We can predict functional stunting, identify children and pregnancies on the pathway to stunting to prioritize for early intervention. And this is based on, on these kind of uh, measurements, easily done, uh, potentially done in the field. Um, we want to use that information to ameliorate or potentially reverse the effects of functional stunting um, and develop interventions based on those biological effects use the biological type to predict the ability of the stunted child to respond to specific interventions. So maybe educational interventions or other biological interventions, which um, depending on the type of um, uh, functional stunting, may or may not give a response. Um, and finally, to avoid it altogether, to develop strategies, because we would understand the causality, develop strategies to avoid the stunting before it's occurred, based on the antecedents and the underlying biology. So ultimately, uh, the, at the end of that, we're trying to um, get to the same goal um, that Thousand Days is trying to get to, um, and to improve gender equality in particular, 
um, and to prove, improve the life chances um, of, uh, um, of the, current, um, uh, the current cohort of uh, humanity. So um, uh, a, a big goal and uh, that is what we're trying to do. So finally, thank you to our funders, uh, the hub partners in Senegal, India and Indonesia in particular, who are gonna take this work forward. Um, so uh, thank you to you all. Uh, thank you, Paul. Every time I hear you present, I'm always like more excited about the potential of, of the work that you're doing and how this can help. Um, so, you know, thank you. I know we're running a little bit late, but I hope we can get some good questions in. So if the audience has questions for our speakers, and I'm sure you join me in giving everybody a big virtual clap for that. Um, um, let me take the chair's prerogative then. I mean, one of the things that, you know, when we talk about, there is this, this wider, so, so we know that the science is, is, is telling us one thing. And we know that the, the kind of political will is telling us another thing in terms of fixing child stunting. So just broadly to our speakers, you know, having a functional definition would be, completely important understanding social values again you know the context that this this functional definition will be under early childhood learning we know can transform some of these children's lives nourishing gender equality on a wide stage again extraordinarily important but what do we think are the key blockages at this point that are stopping this kind of knowledge and understanding from going forward and getting more investment into research and nutrition particularly during this critical 1,000 days. Claire, can I give you a, sure. a suggestion on that? Um, I think it's one of the things that um, uh, the hub is interested in, which is the complexity. Um, just the, the, the sheer number of variables that are involved here. We know that um, uh, once stunting has happened, even when you provide good nutrition, uh, it's very difficult to uh, bring things back on track. Um, and we don't know um, what kind of um, interaction that is having with, with other factors and whether you can pull everything back by changing one thing or whether you have to change everything at the same time. Does yeah, anything can... else? Go ahead. Sure, yeah. Um, I think that uh, Paul's absolutely right about the complexity, but I think that also translates over to how we communicate this message to a lay audience, to policymakers. Um, it's very challenging to communicate the complexity of these issues in a couple of minutes, which is often all you have. And so I think um, a lot of it is about unifying our messaging, simplifying our messaging without losing any of the underlying complexity. Um, I know we're, we're working a little bit right now with the idea of, of the term severe malnutrition, which immediately cuts to the chase of, of the severity of nutrition, malnutrition. It's easy to understand. And um, I think the more we can uh, have advocates and researchers talk together so that the latest research is what's coming out of advocates' mouths, but that it's coming out in a way that's easy to understand for lay audiences, that that will help. Um, bridge some of this divide. Okay, great. Thank you for that. I echo, have a, sorry. Well, sorry, Maui. I'll, I'll no, just sorry, quick one to say that, you know, just to echo Emma, and, and I think, you know, that public, that wider public engagement is so important. So I think as a hub, you know, we will achieve great things. You know, um, we've got a great project, you know, um, we've, and I think it, we, we know now from the, you know, in the current climate, you know, the, how science has been a tool and used in different ways. And actually it's a very powerful tool when it's used in, in appropriate ways. But I think, you know, transposing our messages, you know, our findings, our project, and, and into an accessible manner, um, you know, I think that will garner the kind of, you know, will be a great advocate um, for the work that we do, but also in, in you know, bringing it to, to the doorsteps of politicians and policymakers. Yeah, thank you. We have a question from Amina, if you want to ask your questions direct, the, directly to the speakers. Yeah, um, well, hello, thank you. Um, so great presentations, everyone. It was very insightful hearing all the data about ECD and women's empowerment and all those things. But at the back of my mind, I was always thinking that 
in as much as all this research is coming out, I would be very interested to see, like uh, the, when the other speaker talked about shared values, how do we then translate this research with the shared values of our policymakers? Because I feel most of the times we're doing all this great research, we're going in the field trying to empower communities, but if those shared values do not speak to what the policies that are coming out of that country around malnutrition, around empowerment, as long as those two are not connected, I feel we'll always be doing research that doesn't really translate into greater action and trying to alleviate this problem that we've been fighting for so long. So maybe if we can have some of the speakers just talk a little bit around how they're trying to you know, include their research, but also try to marry some of policy advocacy and how do you marry those two together to create the change that we really need to see. If I could start with the waffly sup and then one of you guys can make it more explicit, that'd be great. Um, so um, I think that there's a very, very definite need to separate out uh, some of these levels of complexity. One is the complexity of understanding how some factors affect other factors. And that kind of sounds a little bit more reductionist and um, you know, uh, multi-dimensional. The, the next thing is the intervention space. So when we talk about interventions based on typologies or um, developing prescriptive theories, uh, it doesn't necessarily circumstances. Okay, so in other words, it doesn't much matter if you know every, uh, all the physical things that affect other physical things. You also need to separately think about in which circumstances can we do anything about that anyway. And that's going to be a matrix. And then you have another complex layer, which is how do you marry any of those to receptive policymakers or implementers? And if you, if you don't treat them as separate problems, I think it can get so messy that you can end up with nothing. So that's, that's where I would start. I'd like to know where the others would take it. I can jump in here if no one else uh, wants to. I think, yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, I think a lot of it is about meeting people where they're at, policymakers. Um, first of all, understanding their priorities, which is always a challenge, especially when you're working across very different contexts. But then um, I think nutrition and gender equality are so um, interdisciplinary that there are, that on one hand, that leads to this great complexity. On another hand, that's often um, a great framework to meet different policymakers. So for example, we have the cost effectiveness mm -hmm. economic argument. Some policymakers are really gonna care about that. We have a security argument, especially now in the midst of COVID and the um, susceptibility of malnourished people to spreading infections. And we have a morality argument um, and many, many more. But I think a lot of it, especially as our world becomes smaller and we're talking across very different contexts is about doing your homework to understand what people are prioritizing and uh, I think speaking to them about how nutrition or empowerment um, fit into that priority agenda. Okay, Amina, that was a really great question. <laughs> Does anybody else want to add to that? <laughs> sure, just to, uh, just to add something uh, in terms of the, um, uh, the Thousand Days um, publication, I think that's a fantastic way to uh, to kind of kick this thing off. It completely convinced me. I mean, it's got the evidence in there. It's, it's well written. I think that can convince a lot of people. Another thing is that something that um, uh, Claire is particularly interested in, which is the decision support tool, which then brings in the complexity um, of other things. And uh, that's one of the things that Hub is trying to develop. Um, so uh, hopefully um, that will be a success also. Yeah. Absolutely, we need new ways to reach policymakers with our evidence, and hopefully, we can do that. So, I know that there's a couple of chat questions, Alessia. Yes, um, so we have a question from Claire saying that she has worked supporting programs to mobilize children aged 10 to 14 as agents of change and linked to nutrition, mostly Mozambique. It's often the very young adolescents who care for babies and young children. They can be a great influence on their families. What experience do you have with this approach? Do you think it has a potential? Yeah, um, could, could I just sure. start with that? Um, yes, I, I think absolutely. Um, well, certainly in the early childhood field, you know, uh, you know, placing children in at heart of what we do. Um, we absolutely recognize that children are agents of change. 
Um, and, and I think the lens that we take, and I, I, I do hope it's something that is shared across disciplines, is that um, we come from a, a lens of um, children's competencies and abilities, rather than a kind of deficit model, if you know what I mean. So we look at, first of all, what children can do, um, and children's voices is, is very important. So the whole ethics of research, um, you know, thinking about how we engage children is absolutely priority, um, because at the end of the day, you know, their voice is so important and they are um, constructors, if, they are, if you like, of their own lives, you know, um, and as a discipline, I think, you know, it's very important that we take that into account. Yeah, thank you. We had another one from Rose. In what effort should the development sector be investing in the implementation, in implementation science uh, and how do we address the shared values of the implementers applying the various nutrition interventions in the community? Okay, so um, I'm afraid I'm not a specialist in development. I'm just beginning to know the field. Um, but implementation science uh, is, is, in my opinion, absolutely where fantastic progress could be made. But it's really, really tough in my world because no one takes it very seriously. Um, it, it's really, it's very frustrating to me. Um, when we look at uh, making theories work or developing theories that are absolutely connected to real um, results on the ground, um, people, academics seem to just walk away from it. So I think there's a fantastic role for it. And what I think the reason, one of the reasons I'm particularly interested in it is that um, community led and community based development, as I see it, um, uh, cannot be evaluated properly and cannot be therefore you can't work out whether to invest in them or not compared to top-down world bank type stuff which end up being community-based unless you can understand the context they're in and you can't do any of that without scientifically studying through implementation science type techniques um what's going on so it's it's right back to the way claire heffernan has set up this hub which is that it's going to be based on typologies and um, under, uh, a grounded understanding of factors which leads up towards um, how to work out the interventions. So all I can say is I do believe intervention science is the way forward for many, many things. It allows the complexity and practical nature that we need for many areas of sustainable development. I don't know how to make researchers take it more seriously, and I don't know how to get more funding for it, but probably the Global Challenges Research Fund uh, will, will open some up some possibilities. I don't Emma, know if that do helps. Have, yeah, thanks, thanks, Mary. Emma, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, definitely. I could not agree more with Marie that I think this is absolutely where this, any research for international development has to be happening on the ground. It's one thing if it works in a lab, great, um, but if it's not going to work in a real world setting, then it's probably not very useful. And I think another thing that we need to invest a lot more research in, in terms of implementation science, is how to scale things effectively. Uh, we have a lot of really great interventions that happen and, and maybe work or don't work in one location, then we try to do it somewhere else. and comes up with a whole host of problems and often it's an effort in simplification rather than complication and that can be yeah, but hard the problem because is that this doesn't count in, in 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 the terms of funders and and especially in the united states uh, united states definition of science that does not count as science yeah and therefore it's not seen as worthy yeah. of being funded yeah. and yet it jolly well does so yeah. where that leaves us i don't know we need to change the face of science mm -hmm. yeah i think I think a small uh, cabal of funders is starting to talk a little bit more about scaling. I know the Eleanor Cook Foundation has a scaling, um, scaling guide, which is exciting to me as well. Um, there's scaling working groups popping up and I, I truly agree. I think um, this will be the frontier and this is how this is the only way we can end and, malnutrition. And it's not just the scale. funders, it's the publishers. You know, we just submitted yeah. a, a paper showing a, a complete development of a, a prescriptive theory for waste management uh, recycling with scaling up for Shanghai City, which has worked. And they wrote back and said, we don't understand what you're trying to do. And it's like, yeah, mm -hmm. so the, the and, publishers have to publish it. Yeah. And mm -hmm. you need to implement these scaling uh, mechanisms from the get go. It's hard to put them in after the fact. So. Yeah. 
yeah, no, I'm, I'm excited about this frontier of research moving forward. I think that is a really great place to stop, unless we have any other questions from the audience, Alessia? Um, I don't, no, I don't see anything else. Anyone else has a question, you can ask directly to the speakers. Okay, I mean, you know, thanks very much, Emma Lynn, Paul and Mari, I mean, for your time and for these really, really fascinating presentations. And I, I hope that this is the beginning of the conversation in terms of nourishing gender equality and, you know, going forward. So thanks very much. And I'd like to thank the audience for participating today and a very big apology for running over, not too terrible but we still that's my uh, my prerogative as the chair so we started a bit late so apologies um so thank you very much speakers thank you to the thank audience you. and um yeah and and let's hope that this is the beginning of of the conversation going forward <laughs> all thank right you, thank, you. Thanks, thank you thank you very much